So we love Twitter in Chilton. So if you are on Twitter, please do carry on connecting with us. Tweet your experience. Let us know what you think of the session. Um, and as I've already said, um, we're using LinkedIn much more actively than we have in the past because it's great. We can go straight onto LinkedIn and we can download the slides and information from each session very, very quickly. So again, join in the conversation on LinkedIn. Um, we, we, one of the things we're thinking about doing and looking at doing is can we, we started to have conversations about books after one of the sessions with Bridget. I don't know if Bridget's there today. Um, but you know, that's the kind of thing we can continue to stay connected even if we can't physically be in the same space. So in terms of sessions and what we've got coming up, um, I was talk about um, some, the, the session last week with Tudor was fantastic in the South Wales branch and more about that in a moment. Uh, we've got Karen today, which is great. Um, next week's session will not be at one o'clock. So just a reminder for everybody that the session next week is going to be at nine o'clock in the morning on Wednesday. And the reason for that is we're going to be connecting with New Zealand. So Greg Dearsley is going to come and speak to us about their approach to um, the COVID-19 crisis in New Zealand and I think that's very newsworthy at the moment so um, Tim Birkin who is one of our committee members based in Italy um, actually organized all of that so um, that's going to be a session not to be missed um, we're very keen to look at mental health issues within Chilton and we know that when we're doing risk assessments which we're doing an awful lot of at the moment as OSH professionals we need to consider the people so um, Sarah Davies is going to be talking about menopause and we want to get as many people into that session as possible because it's not just about women and equally we've got a men's mental health session um, coming up later on in July and Stephen Haynes is going to be talking on men's mental health um, and his from mates in mind so we've kind of got that um, balance but looking sort of outside the box of the kind of things we might need to consider as our professionals. Peter Bennett is going to be is from um, PASMA and he, he's going to be talking about work at height on the 1st of July and from July we will be moving to fortnightly sessions. So again, one of the things, you know, we want your feedback in terms of the types of sessions that you'd like to see. So if you have got some ideas for these virtual sessions, because for the moment we are virtual, um, put it in the chat box and we will pick it up in the chat box because these sessions are for you. So let us know the kind of things that you'd like to see. So last meeting um, was, um, I hope everybody who came really enjoyed it. I, it, was, it was a great meeting. If you didn't make it, then do have a look at it on catch up. Um, we were joined, it was a joint session with the South Wales branch and Chair Tudor Williams came and talked about IPD. Now off um, and progressing through the grades, now off the back of that, our relationships manager, um, Brenton, um, the, the kind of three of us has started a, a conversation about where this could lead. Um, because we know that people want to progress through their grades, but there's lots of obstacles and lots of reasons why they can't progress through their grades. And right now there's such a wealth of information that's at all of our fingertips as we kind of open up into this new virtual world. Um, so we're, we're really looking to develop that session. So it's, it's kind of started something new. Um, I know Tudor is there. So Tudor, did you just want to say something about that session? If you're there, if you want to un unmute your mic. Yeah, just, just very quickly. I, I was really pleased with the um, uh, reactions we got, but but certainly not just in how many people benefited from what we did last week, but you know, both sides of it, Louise. But 
the need to look at it a stage further, we know, which is we've talked about with Brenton and, uh, and that'll go forward. But, but the fact that two networks have already come forward and said, A, can we either run the presentation or can we have the slides and use them within our group? So I, I, I don't think there's any doubt that the need is out there for the topic as a whole, in, including looking at the competency framework, but also to start breaking it down a little bit into the bits where the pre-conversation we had, we know are uh, opportunities to work with others in in parts of it so yeah ha happy to stay on that journey with you and the branch and uh, and Ayush in general yeah so so thank you to um Tudor and thank you to um the south wales branch that was it it shows what we can do when we come together as branches as well so we had we had two cyber bounces last week so so that was a really excellent session and thank you to everyone from south wales so just a roundup of what's going on in IOSH at the moment and IOSH news. Um, as you know, um, for those of us in the Chilton branch, we, we've, we're really enjoying the virtual sessions and hoping that you are too. And as a small region, when we do go back to physically being with each other, um, we have felt as a committee that these virtual sessions will definitely be something that we continue with. So that means that we need a really proactive um, committee. So if you are interested in joining the committee, um, then do let us know. We'd be interested to hear from you. We want people that are going to be out there doing stuff, you know, that are keen to, to support and help other members. The big IOSH webinars on a Thursday are going incredibly well. Um, last week's on mental health is now online to have a look at if you missed that and Peter Kelly was on last week and we had him earlier on in our virtual season of Chilton sessions so um, if you enjoyed his Chilton session then go back and have a look at that as well. Um, tomorrow's big meeting is a joint webinar with South Africa SA IOSH so um, it's a really great opportunity to see what other nations are doing um, and how they're managing risk at this time as well. So do log on for that. Um, you can catch up with all of the previous webinars. You can catch up with our previous virtual sessions by clicking on those links that are there. Um, council elections are open. So um, the face of the council elections is Dr. Karen McDonnell, who we have with us today. Um, so um, when I finish the introduction, I will perhaps ask Karen just to speak a little bit about council. Um, again, you know, it is the voice of IOSH. Um, and if you want to get involved, if you feel that you've got something to say about health and safety, and you know you as part of your professional journey you want to become more active then do consider joining council and do sign up um if you got this week's connect you will see and this is a really useful link in case anybody missed it but the bsi have actually published for free their say working guide in respect of risk assessments for COVID-19. So um, I clicked on that and it is a really good guide. So I would urge you if you miss that in Connect to just go back and have a look at it. Um, and something that I've been talking about quite a lot is as OSH professionals, um, you know, I know that everybody's being affected by this in a different way. Um, one of the speakers on the last big IOSH webinar um, had a lovely phrase that they used and they said, you know what, we're all in the same storm, we're all in the same storm, but we're all in different boats. And, you know, we are all being affected in different ways. Um, you know, I'm working really hard to sort of, it feels like I'm working really hard underwater and not going very, going forward very fast and time's gone all weird. Um, but as OSH professionals, we deal with a range of hazards. Um, and it's really important that we, 
we do focus on those other plates that we have to keep spinning as well. Um, so I thought I'd talk about just really briefly and put on this introduction something about No Time to Lose because it really is a fantastic campaign. And this week, the 400th supporter of the No Time to Lose campaign signed up and that's the company in Nigeria, Ampac Nigeria Limited. And if you haven't accessed No Time to Lose um, before, please do so. There's loads of free resources on there that you can download. Um, and it just might help you to refocus if you've got some other things that you're doing within your organisation. So it's, it's anything to do with um, occupational cancer and preventing occupational cancer. So it's a fantastic campaign. You'll find resources on there um, in respect of dust, um, solar radiation, asbestos was the latest one. Um, diesel fumes and somebody will probably remind me of the others um, but do have a look at that because it's very very good so um, a few little morsels and things are changing very very rapidly um, so just keep up to date with that so um, it's great to see um, everybody on board um, I am going to go over to Dr. Karen McDonnell now. So Karen, if you could unmute your microphone, that would be great. So, let's see. Yeah, good. there she is, she's on mute. Karen, first of all, thank you so much um, for coming to Virtual Chilton today. Um, before we start with your presentation, um, nominations for council are open at the moment. And we've got, so we've got, as I can see, we've got Natasha's here from council, Daisy's here from council, Kieron's here. And we've got, oh, we've got Graham Parker and David Thomas on the line, who are ex-council members, and, and, and Graham's a past president as well. Um, Karen, can you just, you know, for anybody thinking about council, can you just sort of, before we start, just say a little bit about it from your perspective? Yeah, um, I, I very much look at my, my volunteering uh, with IOSH as being a, it's been just part of my working life since I started working with ROSPA being an IOSH member and um, I think you can choose to be as involved or off the pace as you like uh, as an IOSH member but I think that everyone reaps the rewards of connecting uh, through a volunteering type uh, engagement uh, with IOSH so whether it's through a virtual Chiltern branch or whether it's uh, sort of reflecting on how these types of connections can sustain us and really make a change to the working life population across the world. Uh, I think your um, introduction there very clearly demonstrated the, the, how IOSH has responded in terms of connecting through its communities across the world with the, over, with the overarching aim of uh, pushing towards Work 2022. So I would suggest to anyone who's thinking about uh, becoming part of Council uh, that they think about the role they can play now in pushing us towards delivering Work 2022 and also in shaping what comes next. Um, because I know for me, um, it's very much my IOSH connections during uh, the lockdown that you, you turn to, to ask questions of how are you doing things in your organisation, what sources of information are you using? So to, be, to become part of uh, IOSH Council just allows you to potentiate that and I, I personally think it's kind of mind-blowing if we could get every, everything aligned uh, and benefit um, from our, our sort of shared experience across uh, the people who are on this call uh, today, the people who are already part of Council and the people who really uh, can help us to move forward. So I would encourage anyone and I would offer a bit of support if anyone's just needing to know how to get the 200 words right. I think it's a too long, it's a 20 word, 20 word summary, tricky thing. Yeah. Um, but um, too lots of 200 words. So I'm, I'm sure that I would be more than delighted to help anyone who's interested. Uh, so just discuss it a bit further. Uh, and I'm sure fellow members of council uh, would also offer that support. Daisy, Daisy's there and nodding. So I'm gonna, Daisy, do you want to take yourself off mute? Could you um, and just say something about council from your perspective? Um, well, 
good afternoon everybody um so i've been on council for i think this will be coming into my third year i think uh wow it has really flown by wow <laughs> i guess that um from my perspective um it took me a while to find my feet and kind of realize what was expected of me and all the rest of it but i think once you get to that point um you realize that you're you, you know ultimately we the the board of trustees has to uh you know is accountable to the council um and therefore what the whole organization is doing um falls on a variety of different shoulders including council members and i think from my perspective why i joined was because i wanted to see if there could be a way of sort of shaking things up a little bit which you know I, i'm not too guilty of, of uh, too much of that uh, but also just to bring something a fresh idea a fresh viewpoint into it as well um, and to be honest the time has absolutely flown by um, it really has and I can't believe it's been that length of time already and, and I just hope that uh, you know I can continue on because I think it's one of those things that really it's it's a bit like uh, a government it takes a while for people to know who you are and what you're about and then just as you're about to kind of hit the ground running out you go. I hope that when it comes to this, it I can get back in again uh, and just continue on. I think it's really great. And it's like Natasha, for example, Natasha joined, was it was last year? No, this year, September. Um, and I think it's, it's because of things like, um, you know, COVID, we, we've kind of slightly halted our progress, but we're still working behind the scenes. And I definitely think if you think you've got a voice, you've got something to say, you've got a bit of gumption about you, then join us on council because, I mean, here you've just seen three incredibly ballsy women, if I can say that, Louise, without being beeped or something. Um, but yeah, I think there's an opportunity for some really good uh, diversity as well and inclusion within the organisation. Yeah, we absolutely need that diversity of thought in IOSH to really push it to the next stage. Absolutely. So yeah. Go for it. Why not? And if anybody is is interested, is thinking about it, and wants a little help, like Karen was saying with their application, just drop me a message on LinkedIn, and uh, I'm more than happy to help. Yeah, and and k k perhaps uh, just a couple of really quick words from um, Kieran and Natasha. Kieran, I'll come to you first. Just a couple of quick words on council from you. Yeah. Um... As Tudor, uh, Williams can attest to, I was talking to some of his colleagues in uh, North Wales last Friday. Sunday, I was talking to guys in Qatar. I put my uh, phone number up on um, the chat, so give me a shout. I've been doing quite a lot of uh, work. And I'm sure that um, Daisy and yourself would agree um, the description that uh, Daisy used, I think I would come into that car uh, cohort. I'm sure that Karen will get a laugh out of that when it comes to um, being ballsy, when it uh, comes to holding uh, people to, uh, to account and represent the views of the members. Talk to any of us. We want you in there, folks. Uh, we want fresh ideas. And uh, I'll hand over to my excellent colleague, Natasha, now. Yeah. Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Um, yeah, so as Daisy said, I joined in September. Um, I, if you're thinking of doing it, then absolutely go for it. Um, I didn't know whether it was for me, um, so I, but I stood and I was elected and I have had the fabulous pleasure of working with some of the most amazing people I've ever met. Um, and I'd like to think that we've built up some really good friendships and relationships. I think so, yes. Yeah. Um, they're all really friendly as well. Um, so, I mean, I'm not going to lie, I was really nervous on my first council meeting. Um, but to be honest, I walked in there as made to feel part of council straight away. So absolutely, anybody who wants to think, think about going for it, contact any of us, we'll, we'll give you a, a heads up on, on what we've been involved in. I mean, I've been heavily involved with the grades review work um, and I, I've been, uh, been the voice of the forums throughout all of that, I think. So, um, so yeah, go for it. it. It's a well worth it. And, and also you learn a lot from it as well. Mm, absolutely. 
Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, somebody's just asked a question about the process. If you go onto the website um, currently and just search for, for council, it will guide you through that process. Um, so you do have to have two people to nominate you. Um, and um, when you see so put in basically their, their details, which are verified, um, and you have an opportunity to sort of do a self declaration that describes who you are. Um, and I know last year you were able to put like a little movie clip on there as well. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's about sort of pushing yourself forward. And but if you are somebody who wants to become more active in health and safety, um, then you know. Cut, well if you want to get more active just come to Chilton because we'll get you active <laughs> but equally you know come you know go through council and, and consider mm -hmm. that um, and you know if you're involved in the branches as Kieran just said you know you'll find plenty of people to nominate you so that that won't be an issue but yeah think about that and we're going to keep raising this until until that deadline comes <laughs> so mm -hmm. so yeah Okay, well, thank you for that, guys. Um, so as you can see, we will try and be as active as we possibly can. Karen, this is the point where you share your screen. <laughs> right. Now, can you just reflect back to a few moments ago when uh, Louise reflected on the fact that you should be patient with the people using the technology? Um, first of all, I have to say thanks indeed. Uh, I, I obviously, we'd be much rather be in the same space as you all this afternoon um, because to be part of IOSH is such a huge part of what I do. Um, but it's lovely to be able to share uh, time with you in this format. Um, I think that um, I should first of all reflect and I must give them an up-to-date picture of myself, you know, because I felt it was a bit like a picture of Dorian Gray. I don't know if you've Read, read that book, you know, but it looked like you'd brought me out behind the radiator. I know, but I can't am, believe, where I Karen, am the range, all the time actually, we spend you know? with each other and we didn't have a photograph. Of, I didn't have a decent so, picture of you. Yeah. So, yeah, um, so I'm, I'm hugely grateful for the opportunity this afternoon, you know, particularly to talk to you about this topic, which has been a, um, a Rospa key issue since 1996. Um, we firmly have been of the opinion since 1996 that we should be managing driving risk as you would any other risk to your organisation. Uh, so over the next wee while, I'm hopefully going to give you some insights into sort of organisational, personal ways to consider uh, fatigue um, and driving risk. Um, particularly as we go through the situation we've been in with whereby as someone who has routinely commuted to Edinburgh, taken probably three hours of my day on a daily basis for the last 30 years. I've driven under 100 miles in six weeks. I'm going to the local co-op, which is great, you know, so they support our communities. I go to my local co-op and back again. It's a, a round trip of six, six miles. So um, our concerns at Rossba relate to um, the return to work after people not driving, the challenges associated with the road space being used for much more for recreational use, which we hugely welcome. Uh, but where I live, I live in a very remote rural area and people are being out, you know, they've climbed over whatever's in their shed to get to their bike uh, or they've got kids on balance bikes which we hugely welcome also but it's going to get the place where we're all getting back towards sharing this same road space uh, so the return to work the increase in increase in traffic and uh, even considering the depleted mental health the people who are then facing the managing their anxiety about returning to work uh, in whatever way uh, way she perform that is uh, I've got some, there's some notes pages with the slides, so there's some background reading for everybody. So I think CPD is an option for this, uh, if you put the work in after, after the session. Uh, and certainly some free advice and support um, that's available, because the work I do for uh, Rossba in Scotland is Transport Scotland funded, and we are allowed to provide uh, guidance and support to people across the UK and wider world. So it's there for you. Uh, I've tried to build in a couple of case studies and um, I've also gotten, it's quite interesting, uh, some practitioner insight um, 
from uh, an IOSH chart member, Blair Boyd, who's part of the West of Scotland uh, branch network. And uh, Blair and I have previously delivered a session similar to this. Um, and I have asked him if I can share his insights from a practitioner perspective into how he's managed it in his business. And he's delighted. So um, I better crack on or we're going to not have enough time, you know. Uh, so essentially, um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of uh, uh, background and hopefully I can remember. Yep, there we go. Excellent. Um, I always overwhelm myself at how easy the tech actually is once you get into it. Um, so I think as, as practitioners, we very much recognise the that fatigue contributes to accidents. That's a that's a fairly sort of basic statement there. Uh, but fatigue also damages people's health uh, and reduces their quality of life. Uh, and whether that's as a consequence of shift pattern or your physical work uh, or poor poor high poor sleep hygiene uh, or personal health issues, employers need to understand that from a at Ross, but we, we would call it a whole person, whole life perspective. Um, and I think prior to lockdown, when I mentioned that to people, you know, you're trying to get your head around, what does that really mean? Well, we've been living whole people, whole lives, lives since lockdown. You know, our lives have been completely different. Um, I'm sharing uh, my space today with my son's dog, who hopefully doesn't bark at any point in time. Uh, but, you know, people's lives have, have this blend of work and life. And then um, I'm yet to meet people who really feel that they're actually working the way they would work with the life stuff around about them because it's a really difficult challenge for us to to meet so i think on the return to work we need to be better at understanding the impact on people about their the environment that they're within and it's only realistic that uh, basically that um employers have to assess and look at controlling tiredness or fatigue taking reasonably uh, practicable steps to reduce fatigue and mitigating uh, its effects. So there is a, a requirement there for us to look at managing the picture, but I think as employers and as people, we need to understand all the facets of fatigue and how we can perhaps manage uh, the approach to uh, reducing the risk from a personal or organisational uh, level more effectively. I think that um, there we go, I've sorted it now, three in a row, excellent. Uh, I think that um, we can ask ourselves some ve very basic questions, uh, as you see in front of you. Have you ever driven whilst tired? I think that it's highly unlikely that there's anyone in the driving world that hasn't driven whilst tired or fatigued or just, just slightly worn out after a day's uh, work. And it's really about asking you to, to think about what those circumstances were um, how did you cope with them and what you, would you have done differently? Uh, and again, we would suggest that you sort of pause and think, uh, putting yourself first, if you're the driver and you're making the, the choice to drive, uh, or if you're putting your people first, which I've, I've, ident I've, I've invented a mnemonic. I always think icebergs, triangles and mnemonics are those golden threads that run through the practitioner's lives. So I've, um, I'm going to share the mnemonic with you later, um, but start is pause and it starts with P and P is about putting your people first. Uh, so uh, put yourself first and sort of start thinking about what could you have done differently? How could you encourage people? How would you feel about being more open to sharing how you feel about your fatigue or your shift patterns or how that's affecting uh, your work and your working life? Where people might not recognise haven't actually felt tired in as much as fatigued and as much as fallen asleep at the wheel, uh, we would also ask you to consider what we would term micro sleeps, which are um, might just last a fraction of a second. You know, so it's not like nodding off to sleep; it's a fraction of a second, but that's all it takes. You know, so at 50 miles an hour, a fraction of a second, how far could you have travelled? So again, think about that within the context of the people who work uh, for your. Uh, organizations because a fraction of a second is all that it takes um, and it is documented that an afternoon in an afternoon energy levels drop so I'm looking closely at the screen to see if anybody's energy levels are indeed dropping um, or if you're traveling at times when you should be uh, asleep so again thinking about the the impact on the workplace and shift patterns and traveling to and from and work which I'm going to uh, mention to you uh, shortly 
the facts are very much there. And uh, one of the things that I've been doing um, with our um, ROSPA network is looking at the World Health Organization information that you mentioned at the outset, Louise. And then, um, you know, this wealth of information, some people feel there's too much of it uh, out there that we to interpret and apply in our organisations. But I read something right at the very outset, and it was to do with uh, the emotional contagion and depleted mental health. And uh, there was a sentence in the document that I read, and I thought, this is, this works for me. And it's about, it says, facts can help to minimise fears. You know, and you see the facts about fatigue and driving in front of you. You know that 20% uh, of road accidents and 25% of fatal and serious injuries. 50% um, more likely to result uh, in death or serious injury as their high impact because people haven't got time to react. There's no reaction time. Uh, and when people are tired, fatigued, the decision-making process is flawed. So again, we're perhaps more likely uh, to um, have these uh, adverse effects that result in 50% um, of them uh, resulting in death or serious injury. So something for us really to, to consider there. So I think the message that jumps out to me, uh, the, the facts can help minimise the fears. I mean, the fears for me are don't ignore the risk. Don't ignore the risk. Uh, people who drive uh, for work on behalf of your organisation. And I think for me, driving is one of those transferable skills. So um, as working for ROSPA, we are put through an advanced driving test every three years. Uh, and um, it's all about keeping us safe on the road. And I can genuinely say that my previous commuting life was definitely saved on a number of occasions because I understood how to drive to conditions, create enough space around about me so that I could anticipate what other drivers might do. And these are all the concerns that we have when everybody's going to be going back to work. Uh, and they're going to be thinking about what's at work if they're traveling to and from, or when they're driving for work, there's these challenges also. So facts- uh, hey, facts. Karen, just- um, yeah. Just, um, we've had a really interesting contribution from David Whiteleg, who's actually one of our IOS Chilton committee members. Yeah. And David's also a special police constable. So David, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and just- Oh, brilliant. Um, just, uh, you're, you might raise a good point on the chat. Hi Karen, yeah. Um, as, as Louise said, I'm, I'm work with Heart <coughs> Police as a special. Um, and this is this is something for me that that's that's often been um, just sort of overlooked by employers. Um, in that the employers seem to think that if you've got a driving license, that's all you need to do. Um, and some people won't have done any driver training since they were 17, 18 years old. Mm. Um, I recently did my response driver course, which is two weeks um, of solid driving. Um, and the whole thing about stress and fatigue and are you fit to drive was, was a message that went, went throughout the course, yeah. um, both in the classroom and when we were out driving. Um, and encouraging individuals to understand that sometimes they can be fatigued and sometimes it's actually not sensible for them to set off on a drive. Mm. Um, and some to, even to the point that we, we've been told very clearly that if, we're, if we don't feel fit and even if an immediate comes in, there may be times when we're just not in the right position to deal with that. And it could be a whole range of reasons. It could be just the incident we've just dealt with. Yeah. And actually you need some time to, to, to sort of de-stress from that and you can't, immediately go off and, and do another run mm. um, but I do think it's one of those things that because everyone does it everyone drives mm -hmm. uh, or most people um, in the workplace and employers just seem to think that that's it that's all you need just as long as you've got a driving license get out there and do it yeah um, and as, for me this is this is a, a really useful thing to, to see um, and something I'd like to see far more employers be looking at um, in terms of get it, but not only having policies in place, but actually applying those and making sure that people aren't 
overdoing things. So yeah. we've got questions coming in. So we'll, I'll, I'll interject at reasonable times, Karen, but yeah, great. Okay. We'll, keep your questions coming, everyone. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think you're, you're absolutely right, David. You know, I, I, for me, it's a transferable skill. Um, and if you, if you improve people's driving standards in the workplace, they, it transfers over when they're driving their precious beings uh, around uh, out with work. Uh, in terms of the support that's available, uh, in terms of free information and advice from ROSPA, there's, there's reams of it in terms of driver health. Uh, but I'm happy to share a link to a fit to drive package that again is free, uh, that was developed um, working in association with Glasgow City Council uh, post the um, Glasgow Bin Lorry tragedy uh, and focusing on driver health and how important it is. And part of the presentation that we're going to move on to is very much about how do you create the right opportunities for people to have those conversations. So your programme that you've just come back from, David, is obviously giving you the um, how, to, how to broach those subjects and the people you're working with understand the importance of being receptive to those messages. So I think there is a huge piece about how you create the right conditions uh, for the, those kind of conversations because I can hear people of my dad's age, for example, saying, what, you phoned in and said you were tired to go to your work? Goodness me. Or you come off a, a shift and you jump in your car and you drive, however, you know, drive across Scotland, um, which isn't, I mean, it's not that big, you know, but, you know, you may be driving 50 or 60 miles home after a 12 and a half hour shift in a frontline emergency service environment, you know. So these are all parameters that we uh, have to get people to, to consider. And if you also think that we are all sharing the same road space, that if employers get better at managing those risks, hopefully we're mitigating the risks to other members of the, the driving public. I mean, the, the stats in terms of, again, in terms of facts minimising uh, fears are, are pretty much uh, clear there, you know. So they're most likely to happen when, you know, long journeys on monotonous roads, so motorway driving, for example, uh, having less sleep than normal. Um, I'm thinking here, um, and everybody, as, as um, Lee said at the outset, you know, everyone's experience of lockdown is different and everybody's ex sleep experience or sleep hygiene experience is different also. But um, I know a number of people are now on their return to work and they're losing the quality of their sleep because they're concerned about what they're returning to. Uh, and then this whole uh, drowsiness relating to medication, uh, there's been concerns expressed about people's habits changing over the lockdown period, whereby you know they're they're sleeping longer, and um, they're perhaps the um, alcohol intake has increased with a, a situation that's developed over lockdown for them also. So there's all these different facets uh, to consider. I mean, in terms of the at risk, um, the drivers that are most at risk, you know, the young males, truck drivers, company vehicle drivers. Uh, if you drive 25,000 miles a year, you're as at risk as somebody in the construction sector or quarrying industry of being killed at your work. So, you know, high, high level of consideration there for us in terms of the type of risk. The mentioning of uh, medical professionals there, and this was written a, a, maybe a couple of months ago before all this COVID thing hit, you know, but uh, there's a survey of uh, just under, just over 2,000 trainee anaesthetists in the UK that said 84% of them felt they were too tired uh, to drive home after their shift and 57% of them uh, experienced accidents or near misses on the way home. So this for me kind of also indicates how kind of potentially wasteful we are as a society. You know, so we do a reduce, reuse, recycle, but we forget that people have to be sustainable and we've got to make sure that uh, they have a quality of life that allows them to make their uh, contribution. In terms of um, sleep and risk indicators, uh, again, um, if you have six, if you only do six or seven hours of sleep, you've got 1.3 times uh, the crash risk of, uh, this is a representative sample of seven, just over 7,000 drivers in four and a half thousand collisions. Uh, so there's some sleep and risk indicators there. So if you have less than four hours of sleep, you've got 11 and a half times the crash risk. So there's a definite relationship there between the amount of sleep, the quality of your sleep and the likelihood that you can have 
a, a crash as a, as a consequence. So for us, um, we, through the work we do that's, uh, that's funded by uh, the Scottish Government, it's very much about posing these questions to organisations uh, and saying to them, right, okay, you've, had, you've got driver who's out there at work, and again, you can reflect just now in the lockdown. Uh, in the first week of lockdown, my washing machine broke, you know, um, and that's what happened, you know, so it went, so I ordered a new one. And it arrived, and I was interested to know a few things. Uh, so the delivery arrived. The, the, the washing machine was delivered in a van that was followed by a separate driver. So I was really interested to what they'd had shared with them about uh, social distancing and travelling together. I was interested in how many deliveries they'd done that day uh, and asked them to explain their social distancing policy. But I did it all in a very nice women getting their washing machine delivered manner, you know. But it was really interesting to to understand what their working day was like. So uh, if you if you sort of picture it that we've got somebody who's out delivering parcels, they've done all their work, they're 50 miles away from their base, and all of a sudden as an employer you say, could you just do an 18 mile detour to do something for me? And it's off the route, it's in an unfamiliar area, around about here, it's rural roads, they've got a commitment in the evening, how realistic is that? So these are the kind of questions that we want employers to start thinking about and to think about how they would respond to that and the fact that somebody does have a personal commitment that you know about early evening, how would you really make that or is it reasonable to make that uh, request of them? Uh, there's always the piece in the highway code and then um, I've been driving a long, long time and the highway code um, has not been part of my routine reading material. Uh, I would pick it up before I'm reassessed and retested. I would pick it up if I'm helping a younger member of our family prepare for their online theory test. I would do all these things with it. Um, but it's quite clear the rules of the road uh, are there. Make sure you're fit to drive. So it's a personal uh, responsibility. Um, but Safety on our roads, whether it's here in the UK or Europe or the wider world, is everybody's responsibility. We all have a role to play. Uh, so the Highway Code is quite clear in terms of um, taking uh, breaks, about uh, stopping uh, in, in safe places, and um, also some insight there about caffeinated coffee. I kind of wouldn't, and I know it's what the rules say, but I kind of wouldn't take that in as a, something to consider in my risk assessment of me driving uh, to and from wherever I'm going on a, a day in daily or a recreational basis. So that's what Highway Code says, and fit to drive is certainly there, David, you know, so how do employers ensure people are fit to drive? So there are a whole number of different interventions. Uh, and I mentioned, you know, advanced tests, you know, but there's a plethora, I've got a fantastic diagram I'll share. You know, there's all these different interventions that you can look at um, because each person is an individual and each person needs slightly different uh, uh, support. So we, we can consider journey planning, planning the route and what you would do uh, during the, the, the journey itself uh, to keep yourself safe. I'm going to go back because um, I jumped ahead of myself here. You know, that's just have to pause for a moment. Uh, so in terms of the um, planning the journey, it's about maybe sharing the driving, making sure you're well rested before you start. If it's a particularly long distance and you're not in a great hurry, you know, why not have an overnight and stop? Um, and I would say don't drive when you would typically be sleeping, you know. So if you're somebody who's um, a nine till seven sleeper, you know, getting up at four o'clock in the morning to go somewhere, probably isn't the best option for yourself. So just to think about uh, that. In terms of planning the route, um, stops and breaks go without saying, but if you've got the option to perhaps choose a more interesting route, because the, the challenges of long distance motorway driving can be uh, intense. And then during the journey, like stop and think, and sort of just take time to move away from driving, to find a safe place to stop, to be refreshed, to take a comfort break, and, and then uh, move forward. And that all makes perfect sense. That does all make uh, perfect sense. Um, when we start thinking about um, fatigue and its links between uh, driving and the workplace, 
Uh, in terms of consideration of shift workers, whereby uh, how much flexibility do, have, do people actually have uh, in their sort of um, shift patterns? How frequently do they work? How many shifts over a particular period of time? All these different factors need to be uh, considered. For your non-shift workers, uh, have you got a long commute? Like I mentioned, people 12 and a half hour shift and driving 60 miles home to be rested to then come back again the following day. So, uh, and particularly where people are involved in safety critical decision making, but again, as, as someone who drives uh, for work, every decision I make when driving is safety critical. In terms of policies and communication, and if anybody needs uh, any guidance on what good looks like, we've certainly got um, through the SCORSA network every piece of the jigsaw that you need to consider and tailor and implement in your uh, organisation. Uh, in terms of raising awareness, I think this is where we come into being able to discuss fatigue related uh, issues uh, and how we open up opportunities and organisations to consider fatigue. Uh, particularly uh, as economic and employment conditions change and we've had the most dramatic changes in our economic uh, and employment conditions over, uh, over recent weeks than I've experienced previously uh, in my uh, working life. Um, so how do you create the right conditions for the conversation and, and we've had, you know, there, there's a lot of these sort of talking toolkit type, types of approaches now um, and for me um, there are some, there's a really useful EEOSHA uh, guide on uh, having conversations of musculoskeletal uh, disorders, uh, but the pattern of those, and I can say because I was involved in writing them, the pattern of those can be moved over into this topic. So when I get five minutes, or maybe six, that's what I'm intending to do, is to find some driving-related elements that we can have a conversation about and then share that with the, the wider network. So um, the importance of having an early conversation before things deteriorate for, for the people in the organisations to really consider the consequence of not knowing that your employers are fatigued, employees are fatigued, I beg your pardon. And how, what opportunities are you actually providing uh, to allow people to share uh, their experience? Um, and how would people report their concerns if they had them? So even if we took those last four bullet points and lifted them and put them into return from lockdown, they're irrelevant for any conversation you should be having uh, with, with your employees or your co-workers as you move back into, into, into work. Um, and in terms of the, the driver, the employee, how comfortable would you say, I mean, and, and the programme, sorry for going back to you on it, David, you know, but that was a perfect example because having gone through that training, you know how to open up that conversation and to say, this is what's changed in my non-work or my non-volunteering life. And I think this might impact on what I'm doing here. And really today, I don't think I should drive. I think I need to have a break, you know, so those types of uh, uh, conversations. So it's about um, how, how comfortable would you be as a driver raising an issue? Um, and if you don't feel comfortable, what needs to change in your organisation and how do you go about opening up that conversation to change Karen, the bigger picture? Karen, just, just to, we've had some really great comments that are coming through on the chat around um, culture, about just that in an organisation. And also because we've got um, people on the line who are from different countries, there's some interesting chat going on around um, the, you know, national cultures as well towards driving so i don't know if you want to talk about that i think that i think the core principles and the core approaches are the same irrespective of where you are in the world and i know that's a sweet and sweeping statement but I'm, that's kind of the kind of gal i am you know uh, so uh, and i understand that from working with high performing organizations that don't always get it right you know uh, but they're happy to share what works and what is less successful for them. So uh, global corporations tend to have the same approach irrespective of where they're operating because the value of a human life is the same irrespective of uh, where you are. Um, in terms of how you change culture, 
I think it does fall to each individual and how they use the road space where they are. Um, I spoke to organisations last week who um, are applying the same standards irrespective of where they are operating in the world. Uh, but I've been very clear on what the expectation is, you know, so they would not have people driving for work in another country. They would have a driver for them. There would be a specification about the type of vehicle that would be used. The company who's driving them would be vetted, you know. So there's all these different ways that they've unpicked the, the challenges but they've unpicked them because they've had some downgrading events, you know, so they've had the near miss, they've had the um, sort of um, non-fatal collision and had to really think about how to rebuild their systems to protect their workers no matter where they are in the world. But again, I'm happy to share more detailed information about that out with the session. Okay, shall I? I just, I, I just, I wasn't sure if there was any more questions coming, you know. So, um, so for me, it is, it is about the conversation. What I'm going to move on to do now is I'm going to give you some insights into how one practitioner, uh, who's a chartered member of IOSH, Blair Boyd, um, and is an excellent colleague to have. Um, he is with IOSH West Scotland uh, branch and um, he works closely with me uh, in terms of occupational road risk, um, principally through the grant funded work in Scotland. But as I say, the, the, the resources are accessible to everybody, so there are no boundaries with this. There are never any boundaries uh, in Rossborough IOSH world. So. Um, Blair's actually involved in recording a series of podcasts at the moment, uh, safer than average uh, podcasts. And um, I was just going to mention, I saw as we were uh, signing in today, Alan Plum is part of the, the network. And um, I'm going to suggest, just so you know, uh, Alan, I'm going to suggest to Blair that he speaks to you uh, because I think to have an agricultural safer than average that could also include uh, driving in agriculture would be absolutely fantastic. So I'm just letting you know that he's most likely going to be uh, in touch. Um, so, so Blair provided this practitioner um, insight, um, and I said that um, we weren't. We were. We, we do our. What is it? The triangles, the icebergs, and the mnemonics. Well, we're definitely not having any triangles, but. Uh, Blair uses this as a, a starter for 10 in his case, in his approach to explaining how they manage or he's managed fatigue. Uh, and the EJ Smith mentioned in 1907 here, um, there's a sentence in there, he's never been in an accident of any sort worth worrying about. And he presented this paper in 1907, yet on the 14th of April 1912, Captain E.J. Smith went down with the Titanic with the loss of 1,500 lives. So it's a reflection on no matter how much experience we have as practitioners and think that it might never happen to us and we've not seen those challenges, you can read across here into the road environment uh, and just consider uh, the experience and the consequences of being involved in a fatigue-related uh, driving uh, accident. And what we have here is the first of the, the case studies uh, is um, from 2014 and uh, it's a Carillion rail resource and crew van. Uh, the driver of the crew van uh, was jailed for four and a half years because he drove when he was knowingly deprived of sleep and rest. The drivers mentioned there Stephen Parry Jenkins but when I was prepping for this uh, I thought gosh, two further passengers, two occupants dead and two further passengers transferred and I don't know their names. And I think for me, the most important thing about what we do is, is seeing the people 
behind the data that we have to understand and interrogate to do our jobs properly. But for us, it's about humanizing Osh World. So um, that, that struck me uh, when I was prepping for this yesterday. I thought, gosh, you know, I know the name of the person who ended up in the jail, uh, but I don't know who else was harmed. And I don't know the ripple effect on their families. It just goes on and builds from that. So for me, it's so important that we start to tackle the issues associated with fatigue uh, in, the, in, in, in our working environment. The slide in front of you, um, I, I think it's unlikely you'll be able to read it uh, from where you are. You may well get enough detail from it, but again, the, you will have access to slides after, uh, after today. And then um, this is from the Australian uh, Government Civil Aviation uh, Safety Authority, and it breaks fatigue down into these four uh, sort of yellow orange blocks that you see in front of you. So there's work demands, organisational factors, uh, work duration, and this whole person, whole life thing that I'm particularly um, forceful on considering, this life away from work, you know, so the commuting, the socioeconomic factors, and um, the family and social life. So we definitely have to adopt a whole person, whole life approach when we're considering uh, fatigue. So uh, the feedback uh, or how Blair's taken it forward in his uh, working life uh, is very much about looking at uh, the scheduling of work hours and time and how we manage duty times and breaks um, to make sure that employees are informed of the risks um, I think there's a level of control thing there whereby um, we need to provide an opportunity for employees to feed back on shift patterns and what is a good fit for them as opposed to what we think is the most efficient thing uh, for the business. Uh, provide accommodation that's conducive uh, to sleep, providing on-site medicine facilities and ensure employees are offered a balanced diet. So again, Blair's suggestion is we are looking at whole people when we're providing uh, the work for them to do, but also providing them with the opportunity to do the work in a safe uh, and healthy fashion, even thinking about uh, the, um, the nutrition or the uh, balanced diet that's available to them. But it doesn't all fall one way. You know, there's definitely the requirement on employees also. So, uh, and again, this, this goes back to David's uh, contribution earlier. Um, make sure you're rested and fit for duty, you know, so uh, taking future duty times into account when planning your off-duty life. So if you're a shift worker, looking at how you blend those together and make sure and there's an indication there of the type of industry that Blair's from uh, in, the, in the illustration there, you know, the track side working. Um, you don't get opportunities for micro sleeps or lapses of attention there. Uh, if you think that, uh, that you your colleague, or a colleague are likely to become too tired to carry out your duties safely, inform your line manager and declare a second job or any second job that could affect your fatigue uh, and our ability to carry out uh, your duties safely. So uh, those, are, those are clear um, requirements, considerations. And again, uh, reflecting the question you posed earlier, uh, Louise, about culture and culture across the world. I think we'll all be thinking about this from different perspectives uh, because there, there perhaps is this element, a continuum with this topic, whereby some organisations like the organisations Blair's been working with are, have evolved a highly defined understanding of how to manage it in their environment. Yet other organisations might just be having to think about this now because of the lockdown experience and bringing people back into the workplace. Um, and this sort of emotional depletion that can also result in people feeling fatigued. Uh, inform, so the second job is declaring, that's already been mentioned. Uh, if you have any conditions such as a sleep disorder, which could make you more liable to potentially dangerous levels of fatigue at work, that comes back to the driver health conversation. Uh, and what people bring to work with them. Um, I always, um, when you talk about whole person, whole life and sustainability, um, I've always got the reduce, reuse, recycle, right? And Dave Thomas, I'll like to hear that, I'm sure, you know. But um, I'll get my recycling done. I'd never thought about this 
for them to be sustainable over time. And that might sound a really strange comment to make, but when you look at what people bring to work with them, you, your workers come with their home, you know, their home environment with them, but they might also be bringing other uh, comorbidities, morbidities, mm, this is what happens when I try and speak too fast, comorbidities. Uh, so we might have diabetes, we might have high blood pressure, you know, these other things that um, by the time you hit your mid 50s, 60s, you could be bringing two, three, four, five of these to your workplace with you. And that's where driver health is so important. So we've got to understand all those elements and how they uh, interact. So getting the procedure right, uh, where uh, Blair uh, is insights are, are, are fascinating, you know. So uh, shift time's capped at 12 hours, you know. So door to door 12 hours, not 12 hours work when you get to the place of work. Uh, no more than 13 shifts in 14 days no more than 300 miles or three hours. So looking at all different ways that you can um, look at the issues and different ways that you can control what the risks uh, may well be. And these will vary from organization uh, to organization. Local lodgings, and I know a number of organizations that are doing that now, uh, whereby, and they might not just be um, going for a, a chain, you know, a, a lodging chain. Uh, but they're finding uh, at the work site where people have got access to fitness activities, where there's a real way even to cook their own food, to switch off and relax and then go back to work. And the organisations that are doing this are really reaping the rewards in terms of employee engagement and sort of um, worker continuity, which I think is, is, is hugely important. And then we've obviously got and no blame. And the word culture, every time it's mentioned, I'm thinking, gee whiz, you know, what does it really mean? You know, uh, so no blame. The fact that you can say, I'm tired today, or you can phone in and say, you know what, I had a, a dreadful weekend, this, this, and this has happened, and I really don't feel well enough to go to work. And nobody's going to look askance at you. They're going to say, I understand it, right? How can we support you? To keep you with us and, and move forward. And just in closing, and I think it's really always really good to say that because um, it lets the chair know you're going to stop soon, you know. Um, so just uh, in closing, um, I, was, I just thought I'm going to mention two people's names, um, the people behind the data. A few weeks ago, there was the Global Road Safety Conference in Oslo, and um, 3,700 pairs of shoes were put in a pile in the foyer of where they were holding that conference. And that's one pair of shoes for every person dying on the world's roads a day. And Etienne Krug stood and had his call to action holding a pair of toddler boots, toddler booties, and said, this is what it's all about. Uh, so the people behind the data, uh, renowned consultants limited, were fined uh, four and a half, 450,000, gosh, I'm not so good at reading these, you know, uh, 450,000 pounds, that's a lot of money. But the two people who lost their lives were Zach Payne and Michael Morris. And they'd worked a full shift. They were driving a company van. Uh, after the full shift, they were driving a journey of 133 miles with an estimated time of two hours and 20 minutes. And 90 miles into the 133 mile journey after this full shift, they crashed into a parked articulated lorry and were killed. It was prosecuted by the Office of the Rail Regulator. Uh, and the quote you see in front of you is Ian Prosser. Uh, and he said, this case is a reminder of companies that safety comes first and fatigue policy should be enforced to ensure their workforce is not too tired uh, to work. So I'm going to give you my mnemonic now. Pause. Because maybe if somebody paused and thought about the logic of Zach and Michael driving that distance, they would have said, actually, this makes no sense. So pause is about 
prioritizing your people, assessing the risk of fatigue, but not forgetting the other risks associated with what you do, uh, updating your risk management plan, supporting your people to speak up, and evaluating the impact of the changes that you've made. So I'm definitely closing now, Louise. So uh, check out the link to SCORSA. It accepts members from all over the world. It is free and we're there funded to support you. Uh, even one-to-one -one support just to point you, signpost you to the right uh, reference material and support documentation. And these documents that you see, the additional resources are actually on the notes page, so notes pages uh, associated with the first slide of this presentation. So thank you very much. Yay, that was brilliant. Karen, you can stop sharing your slides now. Oh God, do I know how to do that? <laughs> so, yeah, so press stop share. <laughs> Excellent. Yay. <laughs> wow.